Hi, this is Bob McCauley with Superwire. Welcome to another episode in Around Leisure World, where we interview very interesting people. And today we have Dave Noble. Good to have you here, Dave. You know, we have from time to time people that are in show business, people that have started large companies, people that uh, are doctors. We have somebody that's spent all their life uh, investigating cancer cures and things like that. We have a very remarkable person here in, in, with Dave Noble. He is a pioneer. Unfortunately, sometimes pioneers run into ended massacres, but we're going to talk today about something which is probably not familiar with people, and it's the subject is space frames, how that fits in our lives, our future, the future of this nation, and Dave is an expert in f f space frames. Thank you, Bob. Happy to be here. Um, uh, I grew up on a farm in Pennsylvania. I watched barn raisings. I was fascinated with the fact that they would have to put diagonal members in in order to hold the barn up. I thought only gravity went up and down. Uh, that's when I was a young kid. And then eventually I made it my way to architecture school. And the main focus in architecture, structural engineering, was how to stabilize three dimensions. Once you define X, Y, and Z coordinates, you can define any point anywhere with just three dimensions, but if you build to those coordinates and there's any lateral force, this is a lateral force, it'll fall over. Uh, so the main focus was, okay, you define your space with vertical walls and horizontal floors because when humans move through space, they're used to gravity. They're addicted to gravity. So they have to have a flat floor, or relatively flat, so they don't slide down. I confess, I'm addicted to gravity. Right. I think we all are. It's a healthy addiction, though. We couldn't live without it. But once you're walking on a horizontal floor, if things are sloping, you hit your head, and the space is hard to use. And what's worse, it might fall all the way over on you and kill you or injure you. So what we learned in architecture school and in structural engineering is, okay, define all your space in a rectilinear fashion and then brace it. Use cross bracing or stiff joints, what they call moment resisting joints, or shear walls, which are solid, usually masonry or stud walls with chipboard on them or plywood. And then that will keep, keep it from falling over. I made these models out of old TV antennas so I could adjust the lengths. Ah. I couldn't find a computer program Beautiful. that would actually work in four dimensions. When you're defining, see this is three dimensions, when you put the bracing in you're adding a fourth dimension. But what we have traditionally done is it's a tag along, it's an add-on and it's very inefficient to do that in my opinion. It's better to incorporate all of the four dimensions into one set. So years ago I developed this model here. What is the intersection be th between three-dimensional space and four-dimensional space? A little more uh, scientifically is how do we occupy the interior of a space frame, what geometr geometrists call interstitually. That means you're inside the structure. Bucky Fuller is one of my uh, tremendous heroes. I've always admired him. I went to hear about a four or five hour lecture in the Biltmore Hotel and his energy far outlasted mine even though I was a lot younger. He, he was a pioneer in space frames along with Alexander Graham Bell and a lot of other notable engineers. But there's a mindset. When people have been divide, designing space frames, they think in terms of equilateral geometry. If you have equilateral geometry, you can't have right angles aligned with your structural components. And if you can't have right angles, then you can't have horizontal floors set at 90 degrees to the walls. So I think that's why people may have thought about living in a space frame, but they thought, well, that's impossible. There's, the floors aren't flat. That every have too many sloping members that hit you in the head, but... Well, I think you got to throw in there that there's a lot of people with companies that have inventory standard space frame, and they want to sell those things. Right. And you're going to come along and say, well, you probably don't need those. You put all that stuff aside, so you're going to run into that, that problem a little bit. Well, all their space frame technology is based on the, the structural members of the same length, which gives you equilateral geometry. Uh, this, the, I started a company, a corporation called Sixity, S-X-Y-Z-I-C-I-T-Y. Sigs, 
Zissity. Sixicity. Sixicity. Right. Okay. It has a ring to it. It's a new word, kind of like if you were in the days of the horseless carriage and somebody came along and wanted to sell you a Cadillac, you'd say, what's that? That word doesn't even fit in my mouth. It was a Native American word. But now everybody accepts Cadillacs as a, as a useful item okay. in our life. And it, and it is. S X Y Z. S S. S. It, uh, it's a scientifically derived name. S for sloping. The nature of sexicity, four-dimensional space, is it's sloping. That's the fourth dimension you're working on. Okay. The first three are kind of vertical. Okay. But then you add a sloping set of dimensions. And then X Y Z, S X Y Z, and then intelligence, thinking. Be smart about how you use space because if you don't do it right with the increasing population, you won't be able to provide enough space for people to live in decent lives. So the I after the XYZ is intelligence. Intelligence. So S for slope, sloping, XYZ, and Three the I. I for intelligence. Okay. And the big one is city. You can design and build whole cities out of this. It's inherently very big. Now as I understand, what you're really bringing to the party is you can build cities, you can build the constituents of cities anywhere. Any Whereas other people run into the problem of, hey, there's a little hill over there like Signal Hill, and it, that's not going to accommodate some of the apartment houses or something like that. Whereas you're saying, I don't care. You got boulders, you got whatever you got. You're saying that what you're doing here is going to accommodate irregular right. locations. Right. One of the real advantages, other than using a lot less material to construct the structure, is you can occupy land that is not buildable in three dimensions. The way this came about is I was retained as an architect on a big project in Brisbane at the Mount Kutha Botanical Gardens, a mined out gravel pit about 300 feet deep, and they wanted to look into developing that as a premier spot in Australia. And they hired me because I came up with the idea that uh, you could just span from the bottom of the pit all the way up over to the top, anchor it up there, and avoid all the filling of the pit or the civil engineering that it would take to develop for three-dimensional geometry. Problem is the economy didn't afford us the opportunity to go ahead and build it. So they went with another project above a railroad station I'm working on. But I want to really talk about the significance of, of this kind of geometry. I think there's a direct relationship between population density and the geometry that people use to define how, how and where they live. For example, Native Americans on the, in the Americas before the Europeans came over, uh, they were very nice people, beautiful, noble what they call noble savages because they were still living in the Stone Age. They didn't have the wheel. They barely had fire. They didn't have metals. They didn't have guns. They, with a few exceptions like the Chaco Canyon where they had to go up vertically to protect themselves from their enemies. They occupied space in two dimensions on the surface of the earth. As long as the surface of the earth was stable, no big earthquakes, buffalo there for food and building materials, they lived a good existence, but they had a population problem. Their population was maybe less than a thousandth of what we have now, but they had to control their population with raiding parties where they went and killed each other, where there weren't enough resources to live. They could only support maybe, uh, it, it might have taken four or five acres per inhabitant. The Europeans came along with steel and the Industrial Revolution and space frames. With space frames, because of the geometry in four dimensions, as we discussed earlier, if you build to the four dimensions, it will be inherently stable regardless of how stiff the joints are or not. These are called pin joints, by the way. So I estimate if, if you, in going from two dimensions, from three dimensions, and the way we use space, if that up to factor by a hundred times or more of the population, if you go into four dimensions, what does that mean? This is any shape, any size, any place, anywhere, land, sea, or space. It doesn't even have to be on the earth. You, I've designed spaceship shoes. Tell me what this little space in here, this, in the XYZ, what, tell me a right. little bit about that. The purple is the sloping With coordinate. respect to living. In other words, I'm, I'm gonna, living. I, wanna, okay. I want you to build me a house with this architecture. Okay. Where am I going to live? Right in here. See in here? In, once you're inside the space, interstitially, you have clear headroom. You have vertical walls here, 
horizontal floors and hor horizontal ceiling. This is to demonstrate, this was built about 10 years ago when I started studying this, that yes, you could have three-dimensional space interstitially within a, tra uh, a tetrahedral space frame. So this would be our living area, maybe right. sectioned with partitions. Right. This could be storage area. That could be another bedroom over here. Could be. You could have a loft bedroom here. Is that what you're saying? Well, this is, this is proving the geometry and concept, that there is an intersection between 3D and 4D space. And it's based upon having a space frame that is non-equilateral. You have to have different size members instead of all the same members. Well, I took this geometry and with, uh, let me grab one here. I can get up real quick. I actually had a project in Las Vegas. It's, uh, it started with the Luxor Hotel. Move it this way. So they wanted me to uh, design a, uh, a pyramid. This is what started the Luxor project in Las Vegas, this particular oh. model. I presented this at uh, uh, Michael Eisner's office and then it was transferred over. Yeah, that's another long story. But in this one, what I did is, is I designed a, a frame. This, is, this in itself is not a space frame in my definition because it's rectilinear. It's, it's intersecting trusses in order to accommodate rectilinear space. And um, years What happens in here? This, this is like Luxor. You live interstitially in the outside frame and then on the inside, see there. Are so these would be rooms where you would rent? Right. These are hotel rooms in oh, here. Oh, okay. Thousands of them. And you wouldn't have anything here then? It's all open Did inside. Uh, it's like building four vertical buildings and then letting them slope in like a huddle of football players where they all have their shoulders against each other. And you end up with a great big open space as a bonus that you really didn't have to con pay additional to construct. Because Could you put two here and have a triangle? Like a pyramid? You could. What I've done is I take this because it's labor intensive to make these models. They're soldered out of metal. I put mirrors here, two 90 degree mirrors, and it shows all four sides of the pyramid. And it shows this big open space that you can capture for things like they've done in Luxor. Or you could have a, a stadium. The next big project that came along is this one here. Let me move the big one out of the way. This was for an NFL prep proposal in Irwindale, what they call Raider Crater. The Raiders uh, were going to put a, a football arena in a, a, a mined out pit in Irwindale, California, and uh, I was hired to make a proposal using that model that, from Las Vegas for the Irwindale pit, and I designed this one, which was for about 3500 business class and luxury suites over top of a football stadium. This is The scale of this is one inch equal to 100 feet. So there's a, the size of the Rose Bowl sitting inside of here. And instead of having to park out on the golf course and sometimes trek through the mud, you can come in here, there's parking in the detailed drawings where you drive in, you can park reasonably close right behind your seat and you come through the commercial area so you get a chance to spend lots of money on $35 hot dogs, etc. while you're on the way to the event. Mm -hmm. And you can, you can have semi-private box seats that look right down into the stadium, right up above it. Kind of like in the luxury suites in the uh, Staples Center, up on the top if you've noticed, where you're looking right down on the stage. Do you have a uh, computed cost factor that says if you do your architecture this way, it's going to save you X amount of dollars? Yes, we've been doing cost-benefit analysis and value engineering with Kent Bingham. He was the chief structural engineer on Epcot. He's taken an interest in, in this. Mm -hmm. We have to have a real project to build to prove it out physically because you can run lots of figures on a computer and people scratch their head and they say, I don't know what it means. But if you can invest in it and you see that your investment is, is much less than conventional construction and the returns are greater, that's proof of the concept. Hmm. Well, what happened in Irwindale is they had litigation with uh, Al Davis and the uh, Raiders over the way he handled the site 
and uh, eventually the owner of the land found another use for it, so that project didn't go ahead. And then that led to the one that I mentioned in Mount Kutha, where I said, well, just use a part of a space frame and come up from the bottom, from the lake in the bottom of the pit. I had some drawings around here somewhere, and up over the top, and save all the money, on, or not 80 percent of the money on the civil engineering, and save maybe a third to a half of the uh, steel that would be required in this. Let's get some questions from the audience. Okay. Jan, you have some questions. Uh, do you think this is the sort of uh, development that would happen in a third world country or just in a developed country? Yes, yeah, so around my other computers here I've called up some images. One of the uh, projects I'm proposing is housing relief in Haiti. They don't have a lot of land and they have a high de population density there and they had a big earthquake and they continue to suffer. And uh, to build regular traditional construction just isn't going to work for them, number one, because they don't have the money, even with international assistance. And uh, they don't have the inclination because their political structure is such that the, uh, they just don't get big projects off the ground. So I've incorporated another concept. You can see over here I constructed hundreds of uh, scale model cargo containers. And I call it cargo texture. I, I didn't coin the word. I got that off the internet. But in cargo, can you strip that around. Yeah, you can Jen, look at the cargo containers right over there. And then, so these are all the cargo bins here, right? That that map. Uh, well, cargo containers can go too high on railroad cars. It's the it's the accepted mode of uh, transportation of goods these days. Okay. We have uh, the reason I, I got interested and saw the connection between cargo containers and Haiti is lack of money. Uh, so we have to find a way to get cheaper, structurally stable space. And I found out uh, there are more than 10 million surplus cargo containers in Southern California. I went out and drove around and looked at them. Most of the rail spurs out in the Santa Clarita Valley uh, out of way where the land isn't real expensive. So these are not the cars, they're containers that go on top of flatbed cars. Right, they're okay. specially right. designed. They don't know what to do with the cargo containers. And the more I researched it, I found that they take cargo containers more and more that have only been used one time. Brand new cargo container that costs about fifteen to 25000 to construct overseas. Comes here full of goods. It's empty. It's like uh, Meldo Marcus's empty shoe boxes. She took the shoes out and doesn't know what to do with the shoe boxes. I thought, well, why can't they ship them back and ship them up more goods? But if they're empty, then they have to take all the space on the cargo uh, uh, shipping vessel, and then they have to add ballast to make the, the ship seaworthy, so it's cheaper for them to just scrap them, just cut them up, turn them into seal, and then um, uh, build more cargo containers. It's ironic they can't scrap them in this country because of our environmental regulations. They have to take them overseas in pieces and then do the processing there. But that's part of the world we live in. Well, I'll continue on with cargo texture. Okay, now, now this is looking down. This is a plan view. These are 40-foot cargo containers, and it shows how they go inside the four-dimensional uh, modules of a space frame to give a, a, a higher uh, pop population density as far as the inhabitability than in traditional 3D space. All right, I, I've accumulated a lot of photographs of the work that's proceeded here. Uh, in addition to these models you see in the studio here, there are probably, uh, again, twice that many in the Hollywood studio and in my place in Pasadena. But basically, this shows the evolution of uh, Sexicity from the early days I pointed out with those models over there. Uh, through the point where we're incorporating cargo t texture with it and, and we're hoping that uh, the viewing of the website, Sexicity.com, uh, if we are uh, qualified to be considered for the grant, uh, when the judges on the panel review that, they'll see the importance of this and I think we should stand a good chance. We need a lot of money to get this off the ground with the amount that I'm able to put in and my associates have been able to put in. We've invested in the patents, but we don't have enough to build a real project. If we have the 250, we can do a demonstration test module 
that people can physically walk in and see the benefits of it and we can prove out the engineering and show that yes there is a substantial savings in the engineering and the cost of materials because you're using far fewer materials and in, in the uh, use of cargo uh, texture you're using a surplus material that, that you get at an extreme discount at scrap value or less. And you can show some of the models up here on the shelf. I had to get them out of the way so uh, I built this shelf up here. Did you design these shelves here? Right. Now I just got inspired one weekend and Jen actually came over and held that in place while I screwed it in. Uh -huh. Thank you Jen. Business.com. M-I-S-S-I-O-N-S-M-A-L-L B-U-S-I-N-E-S-S dot -S -S com. So we don't have to send any money, just log on and say yes. That, well, it's not. It's, there's an extra step in between there because they've set it up so you can only vote if you have a Facebook account. If you already have a Facebook account, then you can go to that site, missionsmallbusiness.com, and go down on the lower right corner and click, click on, on the Facebook. Log on with log Facebook, on. and it'll log on. And then you scroll down on that page to where you have a box that says business name and type in Sixicity. That's S-X-Y-Z-I-C-I-T-Y. You don't have to put ink or anything. Uh, okay. And then click search and up will come Sixicity with the, the, our, our motto and the number of votes that we've received so far. I checked earlier today and we have 20 votes so far. We have to get 250 votes before July, or we will never be considered by the panel of judges. They have appointed a panel of judges of outstanding uh, uh, people. For example, uh, Steve Anderson, who started AOL, wow. and another of others. You can go to look at their panelists on the website.